Big thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Last year, I built this autonomous catamaran and sent it on a 13-mile waypoint mission across Lake Washington. You should definitely go check out that video if you haven't seen it already. The ending is pretty good. I needed to redeem myself, so I started building a new autonomous boat. This time around, I decided to go with a single hull design. It might be a little bit less practical than a catamaran because it's not as stable, but there's something cool about seeing a single hull bashing through the waves. I decided to build the hull out of this half-inch insulation foam. In hindsight, I probably would have used something different because this styrofoam is terrible stuff. I cut two strips, taped the ends together, and then shoved other pieces of foam in widthwise to form the shape. After that, I glued the bottom on and shaved off all the overhang. I filled the front and back cavities with expanding foam for additional structure and for redundant buoyancy if the hole were to fill with water. For the top, I just used Dollar Tree foam board. Here's where things started to go south. This is my biggest composite layup to date, and it was a big learning experience. For the first layer of fiberglass, I used some epoxy resin that I had had laying around for a while. It was actually specified for boats. I didn't get a picture of it, but for whatever reason, it got under the plastic layer on top of the styrofoam and started melting a section of it. In an attempt to fix this, I covered the melted section in expanding foam. I taped over it while it cured, and then shaved it down with a knife and sanded it flat. There were still some pretty big air pockets in it, so I spackled over that and then sanded it down flat. After that, it was more layers of fiberglass, and I used Bondo resin, which was a real mistake. It's designed for small layup jobs like fixing cracks in your shower and stuff like that, so the cure time was way too fast. Because of that, I had to do small sections at a time, and it ended up not being very smooth. That led to the need for more spackle, more sanding, and more painting. But eventually, after days of work, I got it pretty smooth and then painted it bright yellow. Next up was the propulsion system. I decided to do two underwater motors and one air motor for redundancy. I designed and MJF printed some prop guards that would hopefully block seaweed from getting tangled in the propellers. I had problems with that with my first autonomous boat. MJF printing allowed me to make the walls super thin, so it's hopefully extra hydrodynamic. I'm just using some cheap propeller and shaft sets that I got off the internet. I had to cut the shafts to the right length and then solder the brass end caps back on. Even though the ESCs would be mounted in the hole where it's dry, I waterproofed them with epoxy just to be safe. To form a waterproof seal around the propeller shafts, I capped off one end and filled the tube with petroleum jelly. I had to heat the petroleum jelly up to a liquid before injecting it into the tube. I then pushed the propeller shaft through and extruded out all the excess petroleum jelly. Since this boat is so long and narrow, I was not able to mount the propellers very far apart, so I wasn't very confident that differential thrust was going to steer it very well. But anyhow, I drilled angled holes in the hull and pushed the motor shafts through. I then cut a hatch on the top of the boat so that I could access the interior. To mount the motor shafts, I put silicone all over the holes and shoved them in, making sure the silicone formed a solid seal around the shafts. Here's a shot of the motors I used. I 3D printed some motor mounts that held the motors onto the shafts, with some 4 to 6 mm shaft couplers in between. These are old, low KV multi-rotor motors that are probably far from optimal for this application, but it doesn't really matter because I'm not trying to get a lot of power out of these submerged motors. This boat will go slow for high efficiency. To power this boat for long distance missions, I needed batteries that would last a really long time. I decided to go with six of these RB10 PVC batteries from Relyon. They have LIFE PO4 chemistry, and each battery has its own BMS, so they're much safer than LiPos. Here's the hull, with all six batteries mounted inside. Big thanks to Relyon for hooking me up with these batteries. Check them out in the link in the description. At one point I accidentally stepped on these prop protectors and cracked them, but it was a quick fix with some Starbond CA. Also big thanks to Starbond for sending me some of their super glues. Here's the thrust vectoring air motor I installed, with a servo to move it around. The purpose for this is redundancy. If the lower propellers were to get stuck in seaweed, the boat would hopefully still be able to drive with the air motor alone. I built this mast on the top that was able to fold down so that I could fit the boat in my truck. On the top of the mast is the telemetry radio, for all the RDU pilot data that gets sent back to my laptop ground station. I built a hatch for the top out of foam board and used window sealant strips around the edge to hopefully keep the water out. All the electronics are mounted on this little shelf for quick access. It slides in above the batteries and is easy to remove. After the build was finished, I took the boat out to the lake for the first test. 
Some people asked me what this thing is and I told them it was a research vessel for detecting COVID-19 in the whale population. The whales in the pond are always sick, goddammit. Oh, this is a disaster. That sucks. It doesn't even float upright. It kind of stays on that side, but then if I tilt it on this side, it goes way over. One motor is completely out of the water. It goes, though. Ooh. There's so much weight in the bottom of this thing that I thought it was definitely going to float upright just fine. It's got a ton of ballast weight. It's really heavy, but apparently that's not enough. Bye. <laughs> Oh, I hope it comes back. A majestic vessel. It's got a little bit of a gangster lean, but that's okay. I decided that I needed to get the center of gravity lower, and every little bit helps. So I picked all the foam out of the base of the boat. This is where styrofoam becomes an absolute nightmare. I would definitely recommend avoiding it if you can. But anyways, I got all that cleared out and then poured a fresh layer of epoxy into the bottom of the boat to make a nice hard floor. It started getting all over the motors, so to prevent them from binding up while the epoxy cured, I just turned them on. Lowering the CG by a half an inch alone was not enough to make the boat float upright, so I also brought 15 pounds of extra ballast to add. Look at that, floats upright. Amazing. It's, uh, it's really heavy now. I think with all that weight in there, it's like 40 pounds. Sick. Oh, I'm excited to have this thing plowing through some waves. After building a boat, I now have no idea how boats work. Because when you see one of those big container ships with just a giant pile of containers on top, that thing has got to be so top heavy unless the bottom is just packed full of like pure tungsten or something. It really just seems to defy the laws of physics. Now a quick word from the sponsor of this video, Skillshare. Having a wide range of skills is crucial for projects like this one. It involves design, fabrication, prototyping, engineering, photography, wow, wow, wow. videography, and more. Skillshare is an online learning community where millions come together to take the next steps in their creative journey. With thousands of awesome classes for creative and curious people on a whole range of topics including illustration, design, photography, video, entrepreneurship, and more. One of my favorites is this class on outdoor photography by Chris Burkard. He has a lot of awesome tips for everything from composition to post-processing. Skillshare is also incredibly affordable at only $10 a month with an annual subscription. The first 1,000 people to use my link in the video description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership so you can explore your creativity. Big thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Here's the first real test drive. The boat was super easy to control in manual mode, and it seemed to work great. The only issue I noticed at first was that water would hit the air propeller, so I need to trim that down eventually, or just not do the final waypoint mission in rough water. I think my feet are number than they've ever been, but this thing drives great, so I'm happy. Looks pretty dry inside. I don't see any water around the edges. There's a few drops on the tops of things, but that's probably from the rain. Nice, that's awesome. Shout out to my Patreon supporters. I used the money for some rubber boots, so now I don't freeze my feet off. Amazing. Patreon link in the description, support the channel. So the boat is having trouble navigating through waypoints, and I think it's because the air motor turns out to be the primary source of steering control, and for whatever reason, um, when it's doing waypoints autonomously, it doesn't always turn on the air motor. It's kind of relying mostly, or it's trying to rely mostly on the water motors. So as a test, I'm just going to set the air motor to be continuously always on, and then run a waypoint mission and see how it does. It seems to be doing a much better job now, so I just need to find out a way to make the autopilot keep the air motor on when it's in a mission, or figure out a way to extend that servo actuation down into a water rudder or something like that. So I remapped the air motor uh, throttle endpoints, but I'm still having issues in auto mode. It seems like when it overshoots a waypoint or something, it just drops the throttle way down and tries to turn without very much throttle. 
and that just causes the air motor to not do anything. I'll continue uh, tweaking and tuning things and just see what works. Hopefully I find some solution, but I might have to make a water rudder. So far it seems like it's working pretty well. Uh-oh, beyond line of sight. Hope this works. <laughs> oh, I just realized there's, uh-oh, there's wind out there. Oh no, I'm gonna have to manually drive this thing back. Okay, emergency mode. Hopefully I still have a uh, control signal. Come on, baby, turn. Oh, geez, it's rocking and rolling. It seems to be turning slowly, though. This could be bad. It's not doing very well at turning into the wind, though. Oh, what have I done? <laughs> Not well enough, that's what I learned today. I almost lost it, I, I'm surprised I got it back. That beach was too tight for this boat, especially in its current state. I need to go back to a wider open area for more tuning. So to fix the tuning problem, I 3D printed a rudder that extended down off the air motor into the water. At first, it seemed like it was working great, but then things started to get weird. It is definitely not doing what it's supposed to. This is kind of strange. No wonder my freaking push rod came out. It was just held in by gravity, so that clearly needs to be fixed. <laughs> That'll hopefully do the trick for now. <laughs> so I'm thinking now that the steering control has been improved with the rudder, it might even be overtuned now. I might have the rate feed forward set too high, so it might like overshoot the turning commands. We'll see. Before I had it turned all the way up and it was uh, still like barely controllable, so it was undershooting the turns if anything. It still seems to be overshooting the waypoint quite a bit, but that's kind of what I would expect for a heavy boat like this. It's a race. Swimmer versus boat. At this point, the waypoint performance was pretty good, but I'd later find out that it still needed some tuning. I had to yield to the swimmer. I almost ran into her. Okay, back to mission mode. You got a name for the boat? Nope. <laughs> no names? No, any oh, ideas? Man. You know, you're you know, you got thousands of years of naval tradition here. You can't, uh, you can't put a boat out without a name on it. Well crap, I'll have to think of something. Yeah, you gotta come up with something. The the yellow the banana slug. <laughs> yeah. There you go. I actually like that. The banana slug it is. <laughs> yeah, the banana slug. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. And maybe put some big black watches <laughs> on the side. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's what would be really cool, man. If you could find any of those big sturgeon in the lake. You were probably still like in grade school, but about 10 or 15 years ago, there was a dead one that washed up. It was like, I don't know, 10 or 11 feet long. Really? Yeah, it was a big sturgeon. Holy cow. And, you know, sturgeon can get hundreds of years old, you know. That's and, crazy, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, they're 6, 8, 10 feet long. Damn. And... Does anyone ever catch those things? What? Does anyone ever catch them? Yeah, oh yeah. But my uh, my great grandpa he used to live down along the Columbia down by Vancouver. And to get his third he would take a chicken and he'd make them hook in his uh, oh. hammer and anvil. It had a cable on it, he'd just throw in the river and when something was on he hitch a mule to it and and pull it out uh during the depression they would uh, smoke them and then yeah pedal them door to door you know and make a living wow that's hilarious i've never heard of fishing with a mule before <laughs> <laughs> all right pal you have a good day hey you too well that was a successful day of tuning uh tomorrow i'll have to do like a medium range waypoint mission and try and get an idea of how much endurance this thing has i think it'll be able to drive like all day this new rudder's awesome that works really well. Oh, why is that so loose? <laughs> oh, wait. Wow, my push rod was just held on with tape that whole time. It came out of the hole on the servo arm again. That's no good. Gotta get that fixed. So I've come back to the safe, enclosed waters of Green Lake, and I'm gonna do the first kind of mid long range mission. There's also more lake weed here, so I'm hoping to get a chance to test the new prop protectors. Actions. Set mode. It's in auto mode now. Whoa, it looks like it's oscillating a ton. Now that there's no waves, now that the water's flat, maybe that makes it grossly overtuned now. 
I guess I gotta detune it and see if that works. Turn the feed forward down to like one. Looks like it's still wiggling a little bit. Dang, I'll turn that down even more. Looks like it's tracking pretty straight now. Maybe wiggling a little bit still. I think it might also be caused by the steering being out of trim. I think if I were to trim it straighter, it would definitely help a lot. The control system is still overtuned, but it's hard to tell because the oscillation frequency is really low. You can clearly see it here in the tuning graph that shows the desired steering rate versus the achieved steering rate. Wow, it's so far away. Just a little speck out there. It made it back. Amazing. Beautiful. During that 1.8 mile drive, the battery only dropped 0.4 volts, and that was at the high end of the voltage range. This makes me think that this boat should have really long endurance and be able to drive for hours and hours on a charge. So I spent probably 30 minutes tuning in the steering PID values, and now it's running waypoints a lot more smoothly. There's still a little oscillation between the rudder and the yaw rate, but I think that just needs a little bit of rate filtering, maybe. HMS Banana Slug is a long ways from home. Yeah. Has she ever been this far away? Well, I took it to Green Lake yesterday, uh -huh. and I went all the way across the lake. Oh, wow. So, yeah, this cool. is uh, my first longer range test on rough water like this. Oh, I don't even see it. Yeah, I don't see it either until I look through this thing. Oh, is that it over there? It's way out there, yep. Wow. That's so far away, and it's not even halfway yet. So today I wanted to do another longer range mission to verify the tuning parameters that I arrived at yesterday. But the thing is, the water's a bit rougher, so if it still is overtuned, that won't really show up because the boat's already moving around so much. But it uh, looks like it's doing pretty well on this mission. I am a bit concerned though, because I think the, the waves out in the middle of the lake will be bigger. Amazing. SS Banana Slug can't do that, that's for sure. Ooh, it feels like the wind is picking up now too. That's a little concerning. Come on, SS Banana Slug, you can do it. Waypoint five, there we go. We're on the home stretch now. Oh, it's so far away. That's amazing. A little boat, big world. Damn, that thing is rocking and rolling. Land ho! Look at this. At what point in the waypoint mission this became unplugged, I'm not sure. But I think it made it back purely on underwater motor power. Looks like the redundancy feature is working well. So that's enough for one video. In the next video, I'll be trying to redeem my 13 mile waypoint mission. So we'll see if the SS Banana Slug is up for the task. So stay tuned. Thanks for watching. Bye. While we're still on the subject of boats, recently we had a rare snowstorm in Seattle and did some uh, land boating, if you will. Here's some bonus footage of that. <laughs> Yeah, boy! Oh, you can make it. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs>